A real crime. In a series of podcasts, I want you to travel down some lonely roads with me. These are the roads I traveled with families who never got to say goodbye to loved ones. These family members were fated to live the rest of their lives waiting and wondering. I will begin this series with unsolved murders, but I will also revisit cases that include arrests because aspects of the case are worth re-examining. I wrote these stories when I worked as a reporter for the Charleston Gazette. As always, thanks for joining me today. I'm glad the wider lens of national attention focused on the tragedy of the missing Sauter children in a recent History Channel presentation. I talked about this case in episode three, but I think it deserves another examination. Episode 21, The Sauter Fire Revisited. I can only wish I had Lawrence Fishburne's eloquent way of speaking. Like many of you, I watched him host the recent episode of History's Greatest Mysteries through the History Channel. The show featured many experts who had examined the record created after a fire in 1945 that destroyed the home of George and Jenny Sauter, who lived near Fayetteville. After the fire, the parents never saw five of their children again. I was extremely pleased to hear the people who looked at the case again come to the same conclusion I have, the children did not die in the fire. As I pointed out in my previous podcast, I interviewed the last surviving member of the Fayetteville Fire Department who was on the scene. Jim Rolls was one of several people who raked through the ashes looking for remains. He said they never smelled burning flesh and they never found any bodies. Rolls also told me he did not believe the children died in the fire. Five bodies, no smell, no remains, a firefighter witness. Also, as I wrote in my previous podcast, several experts explained that the fire did not burn long enough or hot enough to destroy bones. The experts on the History Channel show agreed. The Sauter family suffered from this tragedy in so many ways. One unexplained point of added suffering was visited upon them after the late Fayetteville Fire Chief J.F. Morris got the idea to bury a beef liver in a box on the property. As it relates to this incident, one person on the documentary said Morris spoke to a priest. That is incorrect. He spoke to a minister at the Fayetteville Baptist Church and told the minister he found a heart. As this story circulated, it was never clear if Morris or the minister said, hearts do not burn. That is obviously a ridiculous statement. Morris did not find a heart. If he had, he would have reported it, and the case would have taken off in a completely different direction. When Mr. and Mrs. Sauter learned that Morris buried something on their property, they wanted to speak with him. After repeated requests, he finally showed up and admitted what he did. What he buried was an animal's liver, and tests confirmed it was an animal's liver, and that it never came in contact with fire. He put the liver in a box. If he somehow thought this would be taken for human remains, why did he add to the deception by putting the liver in a box? Morris never explained why he did this. He should have been held accountable. Like so much else in life, accountability is essential to solving crimes. I also think George Sauter was punished for his opinions about a dangerous oaf. For those who do not remember, Benito Mussolini was Hitler's partner as they slaughtered their way around Europe and North Africa in World War II. Mussolini was another power-hungry leader who was large on visions of grandeur and small on brains. Sauter was punished for his criticism of Mussolini. Remember the one Sauter child who was missing on the day of the fire was a son who was serving in the United States military during World War II. How tragic to see the Sauter family suffer because misguided people thought Mussolini should not be criticized. While people with the History Channel named the man who threatened George Sauter and who stood to benefit from a clause in Sauter's mortgage, I never named him. I always knew his name, but he was dead by the time I wrote my first article on the subject. I had no way to question him about such a serious matter, but I agree with the documentary stance on who was responsible. One theorist in the documentary speculated that the children ran away. 
I reject this as completely unsupportable and hurtful. There's no evidence for this theory at all. The children were too young to come up with such a plan. And also remember that the last thing those children did in the Sodder home was play with their new Christmas toys. I do not believe young children who are happily playing with new gifts would suddenly think, let's start a fire and run away. I know the producers want lots of pictures, but I hope viewers realize all the footage of a burned down house was not the Sodder home. The blazing fire footage was an illustration, not the reality of the home. I am sure the producers thought any old footage was fine, but they threw in pictures of Lewisburg and Thurman that had no connection to the family or the fire. The old pictures of Fayetteville were also much earlier than the time period. On the 50th anniversary of the fire, I wrote my first story about this case for the Charleston Gazette. Obviously, I never ventured an opinion in a news article, but here's my theory, and it is just that, a theory. I have no way of proving it. After the fire, Sauter told police he always had a ladder leaning against the house. The documentary includes this fact. On the night of the fire, Mr. Sauter wanted to climb the ladder to rescue his children on the second floor, but the ladder was nowhere to be found. I think the kidnappers used the ladder. Once inside, they told the children, your house is on fire and we're here to save you. Naturally, with evidence of the fire, the children went with them. Perhaps the kidnappers told the children the rest of their family died in the fire. Considering the limited communications of the time, for a few years the kidnappers could tell the children anything in an effort to keep the brainwashing going. The hardest question to answer in this case is why did the children never contact their family? And I certainly have no answer for that. The iconic billboard with the five children's pictures seared their images and this mystery into the minds of everyone who ever saw the billboard. In 1968, the family added to the billboard one photo of a man who could have been an adult Lewis. But it's still difficult to understand why simple curiosity would not compel at least one solder child to return home. The documentary was not clear about the two times Mrs. Sauter was awakened after she went to bed on Christmas Eve, before the fire awakened, awakened her a third time. Mrs. Sauter was awakened first by a phone call, a wrong number. While she was up, she checked the coal stoves they used to heat their home and then went back to bed. She woke up a second time after she heard the sound of something like a rock hitting the house. She awoke the third time to the smell of smoke. I think the telephone call was actually the perpetrators. The sound of something like a rock was the fire starter. The Sodders began fighting the fire and trying to rescue the children they believed were still in the house. Crowds gathered as the fire blazed, and some of those onlookers reported seeing a man steal a block and tackle from the scene. This man was later arrested. Later, the Sodders learned from a telephone repairman that their telephone line was cut not burned. One person or more cut the line, used the ladder, and moved it. All of these verifiable movements show one or more people were around the solder home before the fire started. The person who stole the block and tackle was seen by several people after the fire started. One of the surviving solder children was my neighbor. He and his wife were great people and beloved members of our tiny village. I know the tragedy marked him all of his life. They never wanted to talk to me about the fire, and I respected that. But the youngest solder child, Sylvia, did speak to me for the first article I ever wrote about this case. She told me that her parents never lived a day without wondering what happened to their children. When I read Sylvia's obituary, I was so moved that she included the names of her missing siblings, along with the names of her older siblings, whom she knew had died. To their graves, each surviving member of the family mourned the losses. I think malice started the fire. A lack of accountability coupled with incompetence kept any answers to what happened to the children from coming to light. Thanks as always for listening and to Tommy Siner for his always good work. Please listen next Wednesday for a new episode of Real Crime by Susan Williams.